We are joined by General Stephen Townsend. He is the head of U.S. Africa Command. Thank you so much for speaking with Voice of America. Thanks, Carter. It's good to be here. And so tell us a little bit about why you are here in Washington. Sure. So it's testimony season. Happens every year about this time of year. And that's why I'm here. Uh, I appeared before the Senate Armed Services uh, Committee uh, today and later this week, the House Armed Services Committee. So that's why I'm here in town. Um, while I'm here, there's some things going on back in AFRICOM and Africa. So on the West Coast, we have a, one of our major exercises called Obengami Express. It's run by our naval component. It's a maritime domain, maritime security oriented exercise. And uh, there are uh, 32 uh, nations participating in Obengami Express and it's hosted uh, by Senegal this year. So that's a really good exercise for us. Uh, participating in that exercise is our only U.S. warship in Africa, the Herschel Woody Williams. It's an expeditionary staging base. And uh, while um, it's a big platform with a flight deck on it and it can hold a bunch of troops and a bunch of supplies, while that doesn't seem particularly uh, exciting probably for a lot of theaters of the world, it's absolutely the perfect platform for us in AFRICOM uh, because it can stage troops and it can go anywhere and respond to crisis and be in position for a long time if necessary. Uh, that ship is only about two years old and she has done more port calls uh, than we have done in the last five years before her arrival in Africa. Then uh, we have one more exercise going on and that is uh, Justified Accord in East Africa and that's a land uh, exercise run by our Army component, and it's designed to improve African partners, uh, train, prepare them for you know, peacekeeping operations with the UN or the African Union. So, sir, let's start off with your testimony for the Senate Armed Services Committee earlier. Um, you talked about the Russian mercenaries in Mali. Uh, you said that there were about a thousand of them there. What more can you tell us about what they're doing? Uh, so, uh, interestingly enough, uh, the Malian president told me that these aren't uh, mercenaries uh, or even contractors. They are uh, the Russian military that they've dealt with for so many years. Yet, um, just a week or so later, the Russian government denied that there were any military there, that it was only a private military corporation that the Kremlin had nothing to do with. Um, so, we think there are about a thousand of them there now. They've arrived over the last couple of months, for the most part, they're still getting organized, establishing their base camps, deploying their troops, gaining capability, although we have seen them run a few operations, and I believe they've actually taken a few casualties. So it's too early to tell how this is going to go. Uh, my prediction is it's not going to go well for Wagner, and it's particularly not going to go well for the people of Mali. I believe that they're going to regret inviting them in. You had said the Russian military is supporting them. Do you see that sign of support for these Wagner Group folks still in Mali, or have they moved out because of Ukraine? Um, we've seen less of that support, but let me be clear. Everywhere we have seen Wagner go in uh, Africa, and I also faced off with Wagner in Syria, uh, we have seen signs of support uh, from, the Russian, from the Kremlin and the Russian Ministry of Defense. So for example, the Russian Ministry of Defense flew Wagner and resupplied them, flew them into Mali and resupplied them. Uh, we saw them provide weapons, sophisticated weapons that only armies own, not private military companies might own, like sophisticated surface-to-air missile systems uh, and even jet fighters. We saw that in Libya. So um, we have seen less of this direct support. I think probably because of what's happening in Ukraine right now, I think the Russian military has its hands full. I will say that I'm not sure that the Russian military likes supporting Wagner. It seems like it's something they have to do more than something they want to do. What about the numbers slowing in? Uh, have you seen that slow? Have you seen some of the numbers um, go decrease because maybe some in the Wagner group are going up to fight in the war uh, for Ukraine? It's possible that we've seen it slow, but we haven't really discerned that yet. Uh, what we are seeing is we're seeing some efforts to recruit uh, Wagner units for Ukraine 
and they're going out to their global enterprise uh, asking for uh, volunteers. And we're seeing that happening in Africa, although I think primarily that would they would probably deploy or redeploy from Libya, uh, most likely. And what about CAR? There's a considerable number of uh, Wagner employees there, probably uh, more Wagner mercenaries there than in any uh, country in Africa. Uh, I would anticipate that they would uh, provide uh, some Wagner fighters for the Ukraine fight as well. If they're looking for volunteers, they'll find some there. Now, General, you share resources with European Command. Mm -hmm. You're based in Stuttgart. Uh, with everything going on right now in Europe, uh, have you seen a reduction of some of your resources as they've been uh, diverted to European Command? Um, yeah, I would say we have seen uh, some reduction in those resources, but it's not significant, not significant to our, and, and not harmful to our operations. So first of all, uh, we have actually pushed resources towards UCOM. Uh, AFRICOM has provided about 30 uh, personnel, mostly intelligence analysts and planners and folks like that to help uh, UCOM during this uh, crisis. And we've also, we share some uh, ISR uh, surveillance capabilities. Uh, we have pushed all of those to UCOM that we share. And in fact, uh, UCOM has pushed some back to us that uh, was excess to their needs. Uh, we've seen some impacts to things like airlift because, uh, you know, we're pushing a lot of, we're reinforcing NATO. Uh, so we're pushing troops and units and equipment to the NATO frontier. And uh, we're also supplying uh, aid uh, to Ukraine. And so those flights have slowed down some things for AFRICOM, but I wouldn't say that they've had significant uh, impact to our operations. So you're still able to carry out your missions? Absolutely, yep. Uh, and I want to switch uh, gears and talk a little bit about the other big player in Africa, China. Um, you had talked to us earlier about Equatorial Guinea, how that was a place where China had been looking at wanting to have a base, that they'd been wanting a lot of places, you know, basically throwing the chips out, I think was the way that you, you termed it, um, to try to get a base on the Atlantic. Uh, I noticed that there was a State Department and AFRICOM delegation that went there last month. Uh, were you able to uh, get any assurances from Equatorial Guinea that they would resist Chinese efforts to build a military base? So you're right. Uh, the Chinese have placed bets or chips down on all the, almost all of the countries along the Atlantic coast. They're seeking a base there, a naval base, a military base. And um, where we see them have the most traction right now is Equatorial Guinea. And so, as you just said, there have been a couple of delegations that have gone there over the last year or so, one recently. Uh, it was a whole of government, uh, in, an interagency delegation that went there. AFRICOM participated in that delegation. And uh, they were well received in Equatorial Guinea. Uh, the leaders there uh, emphatically deny that they plan to have uh, a Chinese uh, base in their country. Uh, so uh, for now, uh, we'll take them at their word and we'll watch what they do. We'll watch carefully to see what they do. We're not trying to tell them that they have to choose between the, the U.S. or the West and China. That's, that's not the choice they have to make. They just have to respect what our concerns would be, our security concerns would be, and uh, they can have a relationship with China. They can even have a relationship with the Chinese military. But uh, we would be concerned if that relationship progresses to a Chinese military base in Equatorial Guinea. And on the other side of the continent, they have the base in Djibouti, very close to the United States. Are, where else are they looking to build a base? Um, there's, there's been some whispers about looking along the Mozambique Channel. What, what are you hearing? Uh, broadly across the continent, they're looking for bases wherever they can uh, find them because it's a part of their long-term uh, uh, military strategy in the world. Um, we saw that they had some traction some time ago in Tanzania. Then Tanzania had a change of government, and that uh, talk of that base has slowed down considerably. And um, I think that would be good. I think it would not be good for Africa to have a Chinese military base there in uh, Tanzania. You mentioned the Mozambique Channel. Um, we know that they have been soliciting for bases with all the countries down there along the Mozambique Channel to include the little island nations there. And uh, they haven't found uh, traction thus far. 
Then coming up the Atlantic coast, um, I think probably the place where, as we just discussed, they have the most traction is Equatorial Guinea, although the leaders there assure us that it's not going to happen. And then I think probably uh, the other place we've seen uh, discussed uh, would be a country like Gabon. They, they might entertain that, but they haven't uh, really extended that offer uh, to the Chinese yet. What about a country like Somalia? Um, you know, a weak government that needs an economic influx, frankly. Uh, have you seen any conversations going on with the Chinese and the Somali government? So there are conversations uh, with the Chinese and the Somalis that happen uh, regularly. Um, we'll just have to see. About a base? Uh, they discuss a lot of things. They have discussed a base. And, um, well, the Somalis tell us that they are our partner and that they won't partner with the Chinese. So we'll leave it at that for now. And let's talk again about uh, some of the lesser known um, influences in Africa. You had mentioned to me the last time we spoke about how Iran is trying to make inroads in, in Africa. We've seen just recently what they are capable of doing in Iraq. Uh, what more are you seeing from Iran? Are you seeing anything from Iran in recent days? It's fairly quiet. They, they try to fly under the radar. Um, for a number of years, I think Iran was uh, tied up with other concerns in the Middle East, and uh, they weren't very active in Africa. Uh, since uh, early 2020, we have seen them, uh, their interest level in Africa go up, and uh, they are very interested in Africa now, and they're probing uh, with a number of things, uh, ways on the African continent, uh, specifically with equipment. We're seeing the emergence of Iranian UAVs, for example, on the African uh, continent. And uh, that's one example of they're trying to offer things that the African partners might be interested in having and then use that as their uh, foot in the door. So we're watching uh, Iran. Uh, I don't think Iran <clears throat> has uh, Africa's interests um, at heart. Uh, they're up for their own malign purposes, in my view. and. Um, so we're going to just keep an eye out for Iran on, in Africa. Senior defense officials have talked about potential attacks uh, against Americans and American interests. Are you seeing that? From Iran? From Iran, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, so uh, after in the wake of the strike on Qasem Soleimani, the IRGC Quds Force commander in January of 2020, um, we did see uh, some plotting that had the hand of Iran in it. And uh, they were uh, plotting to kill uh, senior American officials in Africa. And uh, I think uh, famously, this was in the, in the media actually, uh, they had uh, plotted to kill the U.S. ambassador to South Africa at that time. Uh, that plot was uh, disrupted uh, and we haven't seen uh, anything attack plots like that. Uh, so if you've heard of that, you're, it's probably has to do with those from uh, 2020. We haven't seen that recently. So no recent plots that, that they've been tracking. doing, that you're tracking. Uh, and let's turn back now to Somalia. That's a place where you were very forceful in your testimony about uh, what's going on with the mission there. You had told VOA that commuting to work, as you referenced the U.S. mission in Somalia, that it was less effective and less efficient you told Congress today that it was not effective, not efficient. Uh, it puts troops at greater risk, a lot more forceful. Can you expand upon that? Hmm. So um, our mission is, uh, our assigned mission is to disrupt Al-Shabaab and to grade their external operations capabilities, to lessen their external operations capability over time. That's the mission. How we're doing that, is within the constraints we've been given by a decision from the previous administration, which was periodic engagement, uh, or as you said, and as I've, I, I have said before, commuting to work. Um, what we've, we've tried this now for about 15 months, every which way you can imagine, uh, short, long, in the middle, long break, short break, in between, do it this way, do it that way. Uh, I have come to the conclusion, as have my subordinate commanders who are doing this activity, that it is uh, 
less effective, less efficient, and it increases the risk to our troops. The risk is in moving in and moving out. This might be seem counterintuitive, but once a unit is on the ground in Somalia and they have their sensors out and their defenses up, uh, it's safer to, to stay there than it is to come and go and to unpack and repack uh, and reload and unload uh, time after time. So uh, that's why I think it's inefficient. It's certainly less effective. We're not there long enough to get momentum and then we start over. And sir, I have sources who have said that operations have been canceled in Somalia as well, on top of having to go in and go out. Can you confirm that? Have you had to cancel some operations just because of the circumstances? Is it a resourcing thing, possibly? Yeah, that's possible. It sure is. We have uh, razor thin margins for our resources, so it could be. Uh, back in November and December, you may remember that uh, the Ethiopian civil war was reaching a bit of a crescendo. The uh, rebels, the Tigrayan rebels, were marching on the capital, and they were closing to an uncomfortable distance from Addis Ababa, the capital. <clears throat> At that time, we were planning to take our embassy personnel out if we had to. Uh, because of the resourcing challenges you mentioned, uh, we actually uh, canceled uh, the uh, periodic deployments or periodic engagements in Somalia to bring those troops out. So we didn't, we didn't want to have a, a, a division of attention and resources uh, with something happening in Somalia while we knew we were doing crisis management in Ethiopia. So uh, my special operations commander recommended to me that we withdraw our forces temporarily mm -hmm. from their periodic engagement in Somalia while the Ethiopia crisis was playing out. And so we did that in uh, November uh, December time frame. As it played out, the Ethiopian government uh, uh, gathered their forces and they counterattacked and they have pushed the Tigrayan rebels back into their safe haven in Tigray where uh, it stands now. And you have made recommendations to the Secretary about the mission in Somalia. You told VOA that in January. Um, the Wall Street Journal wrote about it just a few days ago. Uh, would going back to AFRICOM's 2020 levels in Somalia, would that be enough? Look, so I'm, I'm not gonna go down the path of the advice that I've given uh, my chain of command with, uh, the, to the Secretary of Defense. Uh, I've, I've rendered my advice. I believe the Secretary has rendered his advice uh, to uh, the White House, and uh, we have to let our leaders have the time and space to make their decision. Uh, especially right now with Ukraine going on, right? So there's a lot on the plate right now. So I think we can wait for that decision. And I, I don't want to go down uh, speculating about what my advice was or what would be good or not good. Understandable, sir. So no decision has been rendered to you? No decision that I'm aware of yet. And then just talking about the threats, uh, you've talked about the threat al-Shabaab is to the homeland. Uh, is al-Shabaab the greatest threat that the homeland faces on the continent currently? They are. They are the greatest threat. They are the number one uh, terrorist threat in Africa today. Al-Shabaab is an arm of Al-Qaeda. They're the largest, the wealthiest, and the most lethal arm of Al-Qaeda on the globe today. They not only aspire and have the capability to attack Americans in Africa, they aspire uh, to attack Americans outside of the region and even in the homeland. They may not have the capability today, uh, I would say that's an, actually an open question if they have the capability to do that or not. Hmm. It's an open question? Yeah. You don't know for, sure, for certain? No, I suspect that they do. That's not widely accepted in uh, Washington but, uh, in, or, or in the intel community, but my instincts as a commander uh, are that they do. Are they free to roam in Somalia right now? Are, are they getting enough resistance from U.S. allies and U.S. forces. We haven't seen any airstrikes, um, so there's, there's not really a threat there for that. Talk a little bit about what al-Shabaab has gained over these past weeks um, concerning their freedom of no movement, concerning their ability to, are they able to train freely? So over the last year plus, uh, al-Shabaab has enjoyed uh, great freedom of movement and uh, throughout Somalia. And uh, now they can't go wherever they want, whenever they want. Uh, there are Somali National Army forces deployed widely across the country. There are AMISOM 
uh, forces deployed. That's the uh, African Union mission in Somalia. They're deployed widely across the country. Uh, and we are in and out, and we're always watching. So Al-Shabaab can't go wherever they want, whenever they want. Uh, but they do enjoy a great deal of freedom of movement. And uh, it is my assessment that over the last year, they have grown bigger, stronger, and bolder. Isn't that really concerning? Shouldn't Americans and, and Africans be concerned about this? It's concerning to me, for sure. Um, I think that uh, others should share uh, my concern about this problem. Uh, you know, um, this freedom of action that they have, there's a lot of components to that. Uh, probably first and foremost is the political dysfunction that we've seen in Mogadishu. Uh, the current president is more than a year past his mandate, and uh, they're still trying to get to elections. There is some, there is a little bit of light on the horizon there. Their parliamentary elections have almost been completed, which is a necessary step for them to have presidential elections after that. Then uh, another factor is AMISOM. AMISOM, the uh, African Union mission there, is in transition. And uh, so there's been a lot of discussion about what they're going to transition to. I think that's they're coming to agreement on the next phase in the life of Amazon. But uh, because of that transition, that has slowed their operations. And then I've already discussed uh, the frictions on our uh, counterterrorism pressure as well. Uh, so for all those reasons, uh, Al-Shabaab has enjoyed uh, greater freedom of movement in the last year than they have in some time. And then just a couple more on Somalia. Um, one of my colleagues at VOA had said it, it appears that uh, Al-Shabaab is increasing its suicide bombings. Have you seen that as well? I'd have to pull the string on that. I don't know if I've seen an increase in the suicide bombings. There have been a recent spate of them in Mogadishu, but we've seen them, I think, in larger numbers uh, since I've been in AFRICOM. But what I have seen, what's different, is uh, it was about four weeks ago, I was in Mogadishu on a visit, and um, Al-Shabaab pulled off a complex, multi-target coordinated attack in, one night while we were there. And they attacked uh, four or five separate distinct objectives in the city uh, almost simultaneously, which is something I have not seen in uh, my nearly three years at AFRICOM. They have been able to do a car bomb or a suicide vest or a mortar attack, but I never saw them attack four or five targets in the same night like they did uh, about one month ago. So that's my indicator of their growing capability. Mm -hmm. And what about ISIS in Somalia? Are they growing as well? Uh, ISIS in Somalia is a very small uh, presence in a remote area of Somalia. However, uh, they have an important role uh, so they, they wear one hat as the ISIS Somali, but they wear another hat, which is called the al Qarar office. Uh, so they work for a corporate uh, ISIS and a core ISIS, and their role is to move money in and out uh, for the directorate of remote provinces. And that is a very important function they have that's outside, it's larger than their role as ISIS Somalia, is this uh, function of moving money in and out of Africa. Uh, there's enough money there that they're providing uh, money for other ISIS operations globally. Huh, and that's originating in Somalia? What about ISIS elsewhere? Are, are they able to funnel those funds yes. to, to not only from, to Africa? From but outside the continent to other ISIS groups in the continent and vice versa. And what about the ISIS uh, groups that are over in Western Africa um, or the terror groups there? What are you seeing? What's the most concerning thing to you? Uh, the most concerning thing I'm seeing in West Africa is the number two threat uh, in Africa is not ISIS. It's Al another arm of Al Qaeda. It's um, a group called JNIM, Jamaat uh, al Nasrat uh, Wal Muslimin. Now you know why we just call them JNIM. Uh, so JNIM is an arm of Al Qaeda. They are an extension of Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, uh, and they are very active and they are uh, on the march and taking new ground, uh, expanding from Mali into Burkina Faso and now into the northern. Uh, provinces of the littoral states on the Gulf of Guinea. 
uh, second, uh, I think, after in West Africa to them would be ISIS, West Africa, around the Lake Chad Basin, northeastern Nigeria, and uh, ISIS, Greater Sahara, over to the northwest. ISIS, Greater Sahara, is in a competition with JNM, and JNM has the uh, upper hand right now. So ISIS, Greater Sahara's uh, operations and expansions are limited because they're being suppressed by another terrorist organization. Uh, not like we see, unlike we see in other parts of the world where ISIS and Al-Qaeda are in competition. But those threats are regional threats today, not threats, uh, uh, not significant threats to U.S. interest in the region and not significant threats to Americans beyond the region. But I'm very concerned about the impact they're having on our partners there. Human Rights Watch just came out with something about Mali and said that the Malian army Islamist uh, groups were killing, had killed at least 107 people since December. They were saying that they were executing village chiefs, even children. Uh, this is, of course, where you're seeing a, a spike in the Wagner group there helping the Malian government stay in power. Uh, what are you seeing on the ground there? Can you confirm any of this from Human Rights Watch? Okay, uh, so they're sort of, they're conflating the Malian army with the terrorists. Uh, I would say that I have little doubt that the terrorists uh, in Mali have killed 107 or more people in that time frame. Uh, we do see uh, the Malian army uh, armed forces engaged in um, operations, and frequently we do see human rights abuses as part of those operations uh, because uh, they are not well trained. Uh, and uh, they're not a very disciplined uh, force. Um, you know, they've ostensibly, they've brought in uh, Wagner to help them with this. Uh, but I don't believe that uh, Wagner will, will be able to help them with this problem. So um, I think probably the number one purveyor of violence in Mali is not the security forces, but it's the terrorists. I have no doubt, however, that uh, there are human rights abuses that are committed by the Malian armed forces because of their levels of training and discipline. This was your last SASC, Senate Armed Services Committee testimony. So you are ending your time as the commander of AFRICOM and I was hoping to get your thoughts, your reflections about the continent. What would you like your, what would you like the next AFRICOM commander to focus on? What are you most worried about um, that has left to be done? Well, I think I would tell uh, my successor, first of all, this is a great job. I love this job. Uh, there are a lot of challenges all the time and a not a lot of resources. So you really have to think. And so we have our hands full uh, constantly wrestling with these challenges, which makes it a, an exciting place to work. I'd also say that uh, the African continent is fascinating. Uh, because of its massive scale. There's so much uh, life and culture down there that it's uh, everywhere you go, it's, it'll be a new uh, learning experience. As far as what the challenges are that my successor will have to grapple with, uh, they won't be that different from the challenges that we're grappling with now. Uh, I suspect that we'll still have primarily, our first threat will be a violent extremists in East Africa, Al Qaeda, then Al-Qaeda and ISIS elsewhere, in West Africa and elsewhere. Um, and then I think that uh, my successor will have to continue to deal with uh, malign uh, activity from Russia, particularly Wagner. And then I think uh, China is uh, certainly, it's our pacing threat for our Department of Defense. It's also the pacing threat uh, for strategic competition on the African continent. I think uh, my successor will have their hands full and uh, the challenges will be uh, significant, but it'll be good, hard government work. Well, General Stephen Townsend, AFRICOM commander, a leader in Iraq, helping to fight ISIS in Libya. You've had a, an incredible career. Thank you for your service, and thank you so much for speaking with Voice of America. Thanks, Carla. I think I'd like to just close by saying uh, I want the American people to know what their uh, men and women are doing in Africa every day. There are a handful less than 6,000 troops, uh, 6,000 and change with, if you include our DOD civilians and our interagency colleagues, and they're working really hard to protect and advance America's interests and keep America safe every day in Africa. Well, thank you again for speaking with us. Thanks, Carla.